Either you're working, making money, you're studying, getting smarter, or you're playing sports and getting fit, or you're wasting your time or getting in trouble. The tech founder, Jonathan Schwartz, tell the audience a little bit more about what Lyft does in relation to Filecoin. This is just like a more secure crypto wallet the original Filecoin investors could use to take custody of their tokens. It helps the Filecoin economy operate more efficiently. Your story is a remarkable, it's a picture of what the path to success is. And I was bartending to pay developers and I ended up with like carpal tunnel in both my hands. And that, that was the inflection point to understand your fuel and why you're doing the things that you're doing and to try and position yourself to always have clean fuel sources. Anyone can better their own circumstances with some hard work, some sacrifice. There were key learnings for me at that point in time. The first one was be the inventor of your invention. And learning two was... Welcome to this week's episode of Vinny Vinny Vici. I have a tech founder and crypto entrepreneur in the studio with me today, Jonathan Schwartz from Clift.io. I am an investor in his company, early investor in his, uh, in his seed round, and he's also just closed another round of funding now. So excited to have him on the show to talk about that. And, you know, this episode is just for anyone who wants to learn more about crypto, starting tech companies, um, and anything along those lines. Enjoy, settle down, and let's get into it. Jonathan, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me in the studio. It's great to have you. So, so you're you're kind of local. You're in Southern California. You know, how did you wind up here? Were you born here? No, no. I was born um, in Newton, actually, which is just west of Boston, about 15 minutes. Um, I ended up here in a funny story. I, I won't take it too long, but I was I was living actually in the Bahamas during COVID, which was amazing. I escaped New York uh, with my dog. And I realized then I couldn't go back to like a uh, urban environment. It was so, give me so much anxiety, honestly, living in New York, although it was great to be connected with so many people. And my best friend, um, who's an on again, off again musician, basically called me. He's like, hey, I'm moving to LA. He actually ended his engagement um, with his fiance. And I was like, you know what, I'll come with. So I moved out to LA. A few months went by, he, he realized he screwed up. Got, went back to Brooklyn, got back with his girl. They're, they're engaged again, and I stayed. Um, so it's like approaching two years now, but I, I really like it. I invested in your seed round for Glyph uh, over a year ago, actually. Yeah. And now the news is out that you've just uh, closed around, led by, yeah, just led, led by Multicoin and, uh, you know, uh, nearly $4 million raised. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for your support. Um, it, it was definitely hard work, um, also quite validating. But most of all, I'm, I'm personally just really excited to work with uh, more professionals, learn from folks who have more experience than I do, and, and continue to get better and improve and, and build the company in, in a less fragile way. Yeah, I mean, you grinded away with very, very small amounts of capital to get to this point. And for those of you listening, when I say get to this point, um, the company has over a hundred million dollars in assets sitting through its its smart contracts, and those who are on technical, basically, you know, it, it, it's sitting in, in these crypto wallets and it's being used productively uh, in the Filecoin network. Um, and you know, obviously, you earn fees on that. But can you tell the audience a little bit more about what Glyph does in relation to Filecoin and what Filecoin does? We're going to spend five minutes just explaining this part of the world to our viewers before we jump into the other things. I actually think understanding Filecoin, the best place to start is actually a technology called IPFS, which stands for the Interplanetary File System. And um, my favorite way to describe the importance and sort of the innovation behind IPFS is to talk about, to compare it with actually HTTP. Like when, if you're listening to this podcast, if you type into your web browser, you know, google.com and you click on it, you'll see like HTTP or HTTPS. And that um, is sort of like, comparable, but also quite different to the role that IPFS plays. And so when you think about HTTP versus IPFS, and I'll, I'll try not to get too overly technical here, but it, there's a really good analogy that Juan gave. Juan Benet is the founder of, of IPFS and, and Filecoin. Um, and, and the analogy there is as if I asked you, Vinny, to go read a book. Now, the way that HTTP works is if I ask you to get this book, and I'm like, hey, this book, it's at the New York Public Library go up to the third floor, last bookshelf on your left, that's the book. 
I don't tell you the name. And, and so you could go there and think about all the problems. What if the book's not there? Or what if you pull a book that was actually in the place of the book that I told you to? Like you have no way actually of knowing that the book that I asked you to get is the one that you got. And we, we do this by going to Google.com and recognizing their brand. Um, but that's quite dangerous. You know, you go to a site that looks like Facebook and enter your password. Well, next thing you know, you're hacked. So IPFS is... Let's change that analogy. I tell you, hey, you know, you got to read this book. It's called Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. It's this many pages. And you can go and get that book from wherever you want. And you know, once you get it, you can validate that this is a book that I told you to get. And actually on IPFS, you could go and collect each individual page from different friends around you and reconstruct them and, and actually mathematically know for sure that you have this book. So that's the role of IPFS. And it's for um, creating very long-term structures for storing data. And the goal and the mission is to archive humanity's most important knowledge and information in these long-term information structures. Hi, this is Vinny. Thank you for being a viewer or subscriber to my channel. And if you are a viewer and not a subscriber, please hit the subscribe button. I love producing content for you guys. And I really, really appreciate all the feedback and the comments that you post. I want to hear from you about which guests you want to see on my show. And more importantly, which questions you want to ask them. I'm going to try my best to get them on just for you. Thanks so much. And now back to the show. So that was a lot. Um, the next step above that is how do you incentivize folks to actually participate in this IPFS network? Um, because anyone can store data on this network. And that's the role of Filecoin. It's a crypto asset that is used for um, storage providers who have, say, you know, extra storage space on their laptop or at a server rack that they have, they can tap into this network and earn Filecoin for providing this type of storage. So then you go up one more layer. And when you're a storage provider on Filecoin, in order to guarantee security of the network, these storage providers have to supply a security deposit. Um, what we call that is like pledging collateral. And that can be quite expensive. And that would be like if, if you wanted to, let's say, Airbnb your house. And Airbnb said, actually, we're having a lot of problems with hosts lying about their listings. Um, we're, we're requiring each host to put down a security deposit that's proportional to how much you're charging for your listing. Um, but, you know, if the guest shows up and the key's not there or you put up false photos or there's all sorts of dirt, anything that goes wrong, we're going to take part of that security deposit. And this keeps the, the Airbnb host honest. The same thing happens in Filecoin for storing data. And so what Glyph does is Glyph connects um, the Filecoin token holders, uh, folks like yourself or myself, uh, and it allows, it enables those holders to put up the security deposit for these Filecoin storage providers so that they can store data. And then you have this sort of like pass through of, of revenue that is shared back with the Filecoin token holders. And so it helps the Filecoin economy operate more efficiently. Well, fantastic. Uh, for full disclosure, uh, I'm an investor in, in, in Protocol Labs, which started Filecoin and IPFS. Actually, actually, I was the first investor in the company in 2014. So it was a, it's been a long journey, and I'm, I'm excited. You're about an OG. It. OG, You're yeah, I'm very OG. excited about what they're yeah. doing. So when I saw what you were doing, I was like, well, this makes perfect sense. This is the evolution of where things are going. Um, you know, I, I've had a lot of things to say about Filecoin over the years. Maybe spend a minute or two talking about the inflation curve for Filecoin and what people can expect over over the, the short to medium term uh, in terms of the, you know how that plays out. And then we'll get into the, 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 the sort of non-crypto. Yeah. One of the most challenging parts about working in the Filecoin ecosystem is its um, complexity and its sophistication. Uh, Filecoin had been, prior to its launch, under years of research by some really, really smart engineers, mathematicians, economists. Uh, economists. Um, and so, you know, you end up with this thing that's hard for an audience to understand that has so much opportunity, right? Like there are now thousands of cryptos. Um, and, and so the attention span that you have for each individual, you know, potential investor is, is smaller now. And Filecoin is so sophisticated that I think a lot of folks don't look deep enough or take the time to understand um, like what I'm what we talk about and what I'll, you know, say now, which is basically Filecoin has developed an incentive model that proportionately rewards the amount of storage capacity that's brought to the network. And so what I mean by that is, let's say um, 
I have, you know, 32 gigabytes of storage space on some server at my house and you do too. If I contribute my 32 gigabytes of storage to the network, Filecoin starts to inflate a little bit more. And then if you, you know, contribute your 32 gigabytes of capacity to the network, it's going to begin to inflate a little bit more up until a ceiling. And so one of the problems that we have with Filecoin is um, there's this maximum supply, which is like there will never be more than this amount of Filecoin ever. But we already know today that that number will actually never be hit. Um, there's there's reasons for that. One is transaction fees on the network actually burn Filecoin. So every time someone interacts with Filecoin, a little bit of Filecoin is just gone forever. Those those will never be back. And you know, of course, when you talk about the maximum supply of the token, it will you know it's going to be less than the theoretical max just from that burn. And then of course, if we don't ever reach these like huge amounts of capacity, then we'll be under the amount of Filecoin that will ever, you know, maximally maximally be minted and we won't hit that ceiling as well. And so one of the things that I think is important for Filecoin to do, um, and we talk about this a lot, is, is, is to um, adjust to how some of the crypto sort of third party apps have re- have been reporting data about tokenomics. So back then it wasn't obvious that, you know, a, a metric called fully diluted valuation, which is essentially like if Filecoin does have its maximum supply, which again, we know it never will. Um, if it did though, what would be the market cap at that point in time? And that number can look really silly um, because it's of course theoretical. And I think we didn't realize back then or, or the folks who were sort of making these decisions, it, it wasn't me at that time. Um, those those folks didn't probably realize that that fully diluted valuation would be such an important metric for certain people to get involved. And so I think one of the things that we've been trying to do and push forward is actually get rid of this theoretical cap um, without changing much besides this the theory of it, um, just to kind of align ourselves with the modern day uh, sort of viewpoint about what makes a token valuable, what is good tokenomics, what is bad tokenomics. And I think Filecoin has a lot um, that it can improve on. Yeah, the, exactly. So the because we don't know what the terminal v- number of coins is, wh- why even have a number out there? Doesn't make sense. Okay, that, I mean that's a great explanation. I think um, you know if, if you're interested in learning more about Filecoin, there's a ton of places to go. We'll put some links below to to uh, Filecoin resources. Um, you know, I, I I wanted to jump in with you particularly on um, you know how you grinded away um, you know as a founder. And, and how you built your team, how you, you, know, you got a co-founder on board. We get these questions all the time, and I'm always the one you know, giving my views. And so it's always good to get someone else's views on it. And it may be very similar, but uh, let's just start with, like, you know, how did you, how did you find your co-founders, your team, and, and, and how did you grind away with virtually, like, with very little funding raised? I mean, how much did you raise previously? You know, you talk a lot about failure. I think I I tried to start a company in college and a year after, and, and there were like there were two key learnings for me at that point in time. Um, and, and just like you talk about a lot, persistence is very important in like getting to these places in your career. Um, for me, there was never a moment in my career, even after quote unquote failing or pivoting or whatever you want to call it. Um, there was that was never a stopping point for me. It was more of just like, OK, I actually need to like relearn some things and and take another crack at it when I'm smarter. Um, so like the two key learnings for me there, the first one was um, be the inventor of your invention. And this one was extremely important because in my first startup, it was a mobile app, but I didn't know how to code. And I was bartending um, to pay developers. And I ended up with like carpal tunnel in both my hands. And I was like, never again. Like if I want to make a mobile app, I'm going to be the one who knows how to make it and, and continues to iterate on it. Do you know how many times entrepreneurs ping me saying, hey, I've got this great idea for an app. No one's ever come up with this. It's very unique. And then I say, well, who's recording it? Oh, no, I'm hiring some team in India or wherever. And I'm like, seriously? you got to be able to – either you're the one writing the code or your co-founder is. But outsourcing dev work from the beginning of a company, is, like, I've, never seen it, I've never seen it succeed. You can't, like the only time I could think of that as being appropriate is if you have a business that's being run manually and you you know exactly how it works and you just need to automate some things. Okay, that's fine. You have this standard. But then you don't need to invest the money. No, so the you mo- already have yeah. it. Yeah. So when you're taking investor money to go build an app for some great idea that you have, this is a it's a bad idea from the beginning, in my opinion. Yeah, I think yeah. if, if there are success stories, they'll be like, 
one in a thousand right. or one in five some because one of the problems is when you're hiring developers especially offshore or not really working for your company is they're they're working billable hours so when their eight hours is done for the day they're done and then if you want extra hours you have to pay them extra money for the extra time when you have a startup everyone is committed they own equity they're working weekends after hours the team just works around the clock and that's the way it should be because they're incentivized for the success of the company Totally agree. Yeah. And and you know, like your competitor, if they're technical in house, like their iteration speed is so much faster than yours that if you have to pay for every change, you're going to run out of money real fast. Exactly. So, yeah. So that, that was learning one. And learning two was um, I'm not going to be beholden to investors again. Like at that point in time, I, I was, you know, practically begging family friends or you know local vcs to to invest and and for like of course they weren't going to invest with the traction that we had in these things um we did manage to like pick up some money which was like magnificent looking back on it now for what we had but those two those were two things that i came away with like when i do this again i'm i'm like i'm gonna be building my own thing and I'll never be in a position to need money. When Glyph actually began as a dev shop, so I don't know if you uh, if you had listened to like DHH and Thirty Seven Signals and Basecamp and how they sort of like came up, but very similar for Glyph is we we I quit Consensus. I had a job there um, working at Ujo Music, um, and I was so infatuated with IPFS at that time. Uh, that I quit with my friend and we were just, we're going to start an IPFS focused dev shop. And we just got to get hired by clients to build these really like experimental custom IPFS solutions for these crypto companies that were massively overfunded. So it was, it was like pretty easy to get customers and we weren't building our own product at that time yet, but um, it was clear that we had a business and we were profitable the first day, right? So that that was how we got started and that business was called open work labs and then that that kind of evolved we brought on so my my co the original co-founder brought on the old cto of his company and then we brought on another designer who we worked with at consensus so we we're growing a little bit and th around that time is when we started uh contracting for protocol labs um and so that was when they said hey you know could you build the first filecoin wallet um, the, the multi-sig for the SAFT distribution, which for folks out there, this is just like a more secure crypto wallet uh, that the f original Filecoin investors could use to um, take custody of their tokens after the Filecoin mainnet launched. So we built that. We built a lot of other tools until eventually um, the Filecoin Foundation, you know, I, I told them, hey, with all these one to two month kind of grants, they're great. You know, we can, we can keep working like this, but for us to build a team, um, one or two months isn't enough time to bring in like real talent. You know, we need runway. So they, they gave us a three year grant. Um, and that, that was the inflection point where we could stop this contract work and, and just hone in on what are the most important products we can build. And that's when Glyph sort of really became a thing. I actually didn't know that. And this is one of the very few examples that I've seen of a, of a company funded by grants actually becoming successful and raising real capital and actually building a, a pretty substantial business. So congrats. That's Thank amazing. you. Yeah, it was a lot of hard work. But, you know, and, and in choosing a co-founder, um, the original co-founder and the designer ended up doing their own things. And so uh, myself and the CTO, who's Peter, I think you've talked with Peter. You must know Peter. Yeah. Um, we had at least a year of working together um, in low stakes environments with contracts. Right. So like we got to understand how we communicate with each other, our work styles, our velocity, what we care about. And, and that was a really good kind of like dating period before we kind of like raised together. And you could kind of think of that more like marriage now. It's like, yeah. this, is, this is your ride or die person. And we got to know each other quite well before that, um, which I think was a, a blessing in disguise that we didn't know at that time. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. And it was the third thing, I think? The third, so yeah, I have a third thing um, which came from my first startup, which the lesson learned there hit me years and years later, but it's basically to understand your fuel um, and why you're doing the things that you're doing and to try and position yourself to always have clean fuel sources. What I mean by that is like when I, when I first quit that first startup that I did, I felt like a lot of people were doubting me and laughing at me and like there was a lot of ego involved in that and so the next time that i 
started out to do a startup, it was to prove people wrong. And that was like a big fuel for me. Um, this will be different for everyone, every listener. Um, and, and I think it's important to be in tune with your fuel sources. And I'll explain why in a second. But another one for me was like the way that I was raised, which was, um, you know, either you're working, making money, you're studying, getting smarter, or you're playing sports and getting fit, or you're wasting your time or getting in trouble. And so for me, when I was on my own, um, you know, not in a job but as like an entrepreneur, that was like stuck in my brain and I didn't have enough like so the fuel there was be busy, um, work out and and like keep your head down and keep grinding. And in some ways I was really good. In other ways, I was an, a very unhealthy fuel source for me. But um, you notice that depending on what fuel source you you use, um, you can you can kind of predict where you're going to go and also how you envision success. So there's like, um, there's this story, I think it's in like a Mark Manson book, the, the subtle art of not giving a fuck that book. Yeah. Where he talks about this guy who got kicked out of a band and that band and, and his fuel source was, I need to make a new band to beat that band. Right. This was the whole reason. And he worked And those, those like, you know, vengeful fuel sources can take people to do crazy things and like years and years and years of work. Um, and energy, uh, but sometimes it can fuck you up because his band ended up being super successful, world tours, millions in sales, but the band he was competing with was Metallica, and he felt like a failure. And so when you have, when, when you check your fuel source and, and it's a healthy reason, it, it helps you analyze when should I be pivoting, when should I quit, when like those types of questions become actually very easy to answer. Um, and so that's that's a little bit different from what well actually kind of it is it isn't I, fuel sources for me change over time so what it was a year ago is not what it is now and what is it now i have a confidence that i can push myself to do things that i didn't think were capable so like to break my own barriers of limitation kind of like more of like a david goggins kind of like i want to push past that 40 percent and see how far i can get like if i really apply focus and my mind and my energy to a project what what can happen there um, once you're equipped with all the skills that I've spent a long time kind of honing, which is, you know, the sales, the engineering, all those things coming together. What can you make? And, and actually, in today's like digital world with all the tools and the AI we have, a one person team, a two person team can be a huge, like huge amount of output and, and velocity. So for me, that's number one. There's still a lot of like proving doubters wrong. Um, that's definitely there. There's, of course, like, I think for everyone, there's a little bit of ego involved. Not any more dangerous than someone with a chip on their shoulder. A hundred percent. It took me, I, I sacrificed so much just with the chip on the shoulder. I just wanted to be something more than a small town boy, you know? And so the things that you will do to prove that are like, because people thought that of me, I mean, like the teachers at school, the kids, they're always like, you know, you're going to be stuck here the rest of your life. Like, like all of us. I'm like, no, I'm not. There's different types of fuel source that that can be that can be healthier i think like um learning like having fun these are just like easy ones that i think if everyone kind of incorporated those things into their like why am i doing this well because i actually for glyph like i wake up and i'm so excited um just to keep going you made a comment early on that you're a barman uh in new york and you were trying to start this tech company app whatever you were trying to do at that point in time and then you, you didn't know how to code this is a common problem for a lot of people. They don't know how to code. What do you do to become a coder? And and actually, not just any coder. You're 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 a world class developer. Thank you, thank and, you. you know, it's very clear because, and I can say that you know, like, in a very unbiased unbi biased way, because literally your your code is protecting billions of dollars right now. <laughs> and so you've written, and, and and not just in any industry, you know, like banking or whatever. Where there's tons of safeguards in crypto where anyone can hack a, a smart contract and a wallet. So, so you're you're an exceptional engineer. How did you go from being a barman with no coding skills to to this level of of engineering? Well, first of all, thank you. Um, I still I personally feel like I have a long way to go, and there's people like on the Glyph team who put me and they make me look like shit coders. So, um, but you know, for me, I I just. It was the chip on the shoulder for me. Like, I would not put the book down. Um, I just kept at it. And I, at first, it was well, like... No, I'll go in detail. So what book? What, what, okay, what, so at first, I started... Well, in, my, in the first startup, basically, there would be these scripts. 
And the first thing that I started doing was, I'm not going to pay these engineers to just edit these scripts. I'm going to just edit the script. What language was it in? That was Python. Python, okay. Yeah. And so I, I figured out like how to edit these scripts. I'm like, okay. And, and I got lucky because I didn't know how to code, but I understood architectural relationships in software. So this is a server that sends information to these mobile apps, which then respond. So I had the lay of the kind of the software stack. Um, then, then I learned of and these coding when was this? What year was that this? That was 2015, 2016. Okay, so it's not that long ago. No, no. I've not been coding that long, actually. That was just in Slack. In Slack, okay. Yeah, I'd, be, I'd send them back a, a text file, and I'd be like, execute that. Okay. Yeah, and they would do it. Um, and it was quite scary. I definitely broke things, and um, but it didn't matter. We didn't have that many users. It was... Yeah, but to me at the time, it was like the biggest, oh my God, our app's down and like 50 people cared, you know? So, um, but uh, then I learned of these coding boot camps. I went to Full Stack Academy, which was n which is no longer around. It's been acquired or something. And, but th so there's- Person or virtual? That was in person. Okay. Yeah, so that's actually what took me out of Boston into New York. Okay. Um, and I'd saved up enough money, like bartending. I used everything I had, basically. How much did it cost you? That was 17 grand. Okay, so you saved up 17 grand to teach yourself how to code and yeah. in, at an in-person camp. Now, not everyone can afford that or can earn that. It's, yeah. it's very expensive. But if you can afford it, you, you'd say that is way better than doing an online course or not? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm out of date on the best learning materials. I think actually... I, I learned to code old school at university. It's it's a very different experience than when you're with other people and and even if you're just coding stuff like you know bouncing ideas back and forth and engineering is very different in person. Uh, and you know, so, but I, I, like some people need to learn that way, and others can just go do an online free course uh, as well. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think that I do think you're probably right. That's up to the the learner. I also think having like it, it is largely dependent on the teacher. Um, and and if you have an online teacher and in person, but they're like a great teacher, I think you'll probably find success. I think for me, the most important thing to have come out of that boot camp, like they didn't teach you anything about crypto. They didn't teach you like it was it was to open the black box and learn how to decipher what's in there. So. What I mean by that is like, even even now, like if I don't know how something in my car works, now that I know how to code, I'm like, I could I could watch enough YouTube videos and figure this out. Could like, will it will it be worth my while? Probably not, I'll probably take it to the shop. But like at that time, it was like, I don't know how to do this thing. Let me read some documentation, watch some videos to figure this out. And then once you have that fulfilling experience where you go through this thing where you didn't know how to do it, you learned how to do it, and then you actually produce the result, that for me was a very like emotionally fulfilling process. So I just got it. Like, so so you, you, so you got this course paid for with your own money that you earned. You went to New York for three months. That, at that time, yeah, I was like, where were you staying? That was my buddy from college needed a fourth roommate. So there was this tiny little box room in Manhattan in Union Square, and I, I love these stories. This is how yeah, like, this is character building. Mice, mice were coming th every morning. I'd walk up, mice would be coming out of the stove and shit. It was yeah, it wasn't great, but it was it was a fun time and and yeah, um, and that that boot camp really the, the there's boot camps that take you from zero to one, and then there's boot camps that take you from like one to two. So that one there's an interview process. So you actually need to know how to code to get in. Um, that I would recommend that style much more than the zero to one. Zero to one is you can get there yourself. So yeah, I agree. The zero to one stuff, you can go online, you can learn the basics of coding pretty quickly, mostly for free. Right. In fact, you can probably get ChatGPT to teach you how to code. That's the thing. You can yeah. literally go to ChatGPT and say, hey, uh, you know, help me understand coding concepts, etc." But there's lots of free resources. Even 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 the ones that pay for it's like maybe 50 bucks or something, 100 bucks. Yeah. Um, and you know, obviously YouTube's got tons of free videos. So... That was a, a, a clearly a very important stepping stone for you. You got there, and the bug got bitten. What language were you learning? That was all JavaScript. It's all JavaScript. At that time. Okay. Yeah. Now pretty much all Go. A lot of Solidity. I do like all the smart contracts. Okay. Um, yeah. I haven't coded JavaScript in a couple of years, probably. Now. Okay. Yeah. So how did you transition from JavaScript to? Well, so so for me, once once I got my confidence built in the engineering realm, and like knowing that I can solve these problems. Yeah. Um, and, and it was a great, actually the, the style of the boot camp was great because they expected you not to finish each assignment, right? But I, I was just like, I'm going to finish every assignment. Like, and I, I 
I don't think there were people at that boot camp who were much more intelligent than me, but very few who had the chip that I had, which was like, I'm going to do this pr- like again. I'm going to start another business. And at that time, it was actually I wanted to predict the stock market with um, with music. Mm-hmm. I had a thing that I need to do, which is like I, I need to predict the stock market. So like I need to learn everything as fast as I can to get back into the arena, quote unquote, and like try this again. Um and so I would stay up late just writing writing code. I like I barely went out. I would I would just it was so fun for me at that time, especially going from bartending and interrupting customers to try and get them to download my app, like very, very faced like around lots of people to two headphones on, just creating. It's a picture of what success you know, what the path to success is. Like for you know, for people out there listening who want to become developers want to build their own uh, app, dream of having their own tech company. You know, you're a shining example of how it's possible to be go from being a bartender literally <laughs> yeah. to a, a super successful uh, engineer and, and and startup founder. And it wasn't an easy journey. You had to you know you had to work, save money teach yourself and learn but there are no excuses in this world if you even if you have a smidge of opportunity to actually go in you know, if you live in america you have a lot more opportunity than anywhere else in the world generally speaking you can get a barman job you can earn the money you can get go to a boot camp you can learn how to code other parts of the world i'm, I'm a lot more sympathetic because it's a lot harder but in america where we have very low unemployment right now um you know anyone can better their own circumstances with some hard work some sacrifice just the willingness to go in you know sleep on a friend's couch or rent a room in a, in a, you know, mice infested house, <laughs> um, you know, and, and just work harder than everyone else. And that, and that's the one thing which I think people miss out. You are not going to be successful in life working the same hours as your peers. And I remember telling my friends who always ask me like, why are you still working? You don't get paid extra money for working longer hours. And my answer was very simple. If I'm working eight hours a day and everyone else in the office working eight hours a day, I'm not going to get ahead. But if I'm working 16, 17, 18 hours a day, even if I'm not getting paid for it, I'm going to learn more and accomplish more than all my peers because I'm going to move faster than them and I'm going to basically increase my knowledge and skill base. And I did that. And that's why I was successful at a very young age. I was My first company was when I was 24 years old and it was a big success. And so, you know, it was because when, between the age of 21 and 24, I literally- You put the work in. I put the hours in. Yeah. And I grinded away and I sacrificed. And I think that that's something which, you know, it, it's not about uh, glamorizing, you know, suffering. Because it was, you know, it wasn't easy. Yeah, but yeah. It, it's just, that is the journey to success in life. Totally. Well, I think it's it's interesting you say that because just checking back to the fuel source, I think a lot of people, ego and clout is a fuel source for starting companies. Um, especially around LA, uh, is, oh, if I start a company, I'm kind of like above my peers. And then you realize very quickly, early days company, you will get shit on. Like, you have to bite your ego, get countless rejections, um, and just eat, eat the shit. Like, when I first started the dev shop, I quit consensus. I was making six figures as an engineer, and down to dev shopping, I was my starting salary was 30 and I, I could barely afford, you know, to live in New York, these things. So, you know, ego is not enough on its own um, to, I think, get you through those tough passages. Like, you need something else. You need the, I'm not a, I'm not a regular boy in this town. I'm going to get out of here. You need that um, in addition to, like, you know, whatever else it is. Yeah, you. one of my toughest experiences as a founder was when I, I was literally working two jobs as a founder, I was working my startup job and I had a side gig which basically paid the bills. And I had to work, you know, uh, probably, I don't know, 16 hours a week on that, plus my main job running a, a small startup because we didn't have money to pay me that much. So I had to go and scrape the money together. Super it's hard. And, and you're so tired. And like after like months and months, and I remember like we were working Christmas Day, um, you know, just because you had to. And there was no, totally. and, and answering like hundreds of tickets from customers and stuff like that. Like it was, being a founder is hard. Don't let anyone tell you it's easy. Um, it's really hard, especially if you want to be successful. You have to, you have to put in the sweat equity, the capital that you don't have in form of cash. It's got to come in sweat. Yep, yep. And that's really what it is. So, okay, what's next for you now? So you're on this journey. You know, look, everything looks great from a sort of product perspective, market traction, investors are loving you. 
Um, what, what, what's your vision for where you want to go with your career and, 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 and live? Especially given the context of how it started, which was solving like Filecoin's most important problems. That, that's kind of what we want to continue to do, right? Like uh, the stuff that we've made up until now has done a great job of solving a lot of the capital inefficiencies on Filecoin network, but the, but the network has a number of other things that, that could be improved. Um, and so for us, it's just staying in tune um, as close as we can with the different network participants, whether that's token holders or the storage providers, understanding what are the most painful problems that they have and just continuing to solve those problems or finding other teams to do it and working with them. Um, I, in crypto, things move so fast that I don't, I don't really have like a past a six month roadmap. Um, it's like whatever problem there is in front of us, that's the one that we'll probably solve. Um, we have some new exciting features that will drop and, and um, capital efficiency improvements that are coming to Glyph, just make hardening what we've made, making it more stable. Um, you know, th those things are always a work in progress and, and continuing to learn, but also shaping the business in a way that allows our team to continue to do the things that we all love to do, um, which I think is important too. Um, and especially for like the entrepreneurs that are listening, it, it's funny because for me, engineering is the most fun part of my job. And the longer this has gone on, the less time I... The founder's paradox, right? You start yeah. off technical and you end up very, very untechnical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and it's fun. Like I, I Trust me, I know. Like, it's, it's one, you too. My, yeah. my career has been... The, like, the longer my career has gone on, the further and further away I've, been, I've gotten away from code. I know, it's a shame. It's a shame, yeah. But it's fun in other ways, right? And, and um, so for me, it's about setting up the right processes to stay really lean like in today's world i don't think you need a team bigger than like 12 people so like well especially peer programming is taken care of by ai now you don't to totally you don't need uh, to do peer programming anymore oh you can God, cut your I team in it. half it's great yeah it, it's really really an amazing time um and, and no code platforms are, are fantastic as right? well yeah and that's that's another thing um with with starting businesses and and like back when i realized that in order for me to start the type of business that i wanted to start one, I needed to be the inventor of my own invention, which for me at that time meant learning to code. Um, but like today, um, I actually don't know if that's still true. I, I think that regardless, learning to code is extremely valuable. And I would I would tell anyone that it's worth their time. I agree. Um, but like I have other friends. So for example, I have a friend, she's a really, really bright uh, woman and she's a UX designer. She had an idea for a dating app. And um, and. She comes to me and she says, hey, what do you think about this idea? And like, how long would it take you to build this? And, and I'm like, well, first of all, about the idea, I think it's cool, but like, I don't know. Like, no one will be able to tell you if this is a good idea or not, besides if you go out there and try and sell it. And two, how long would it take me to build this app? Well, the app was like a video interview dating app where you like pre-record a video of yourself and then you get like once a day someone else's video and you can like text or you know you could theoretically match with just like one inter like and the style of interview was not like you couldn't prepare for it so they would ask you questions and you didn't know what was coming and whatever video you put up was the one that was going out which made it really authentic and i was like i actually i actually think this is a good idea but will others i have no idea and f so when i'm like how long would it take me to build this i was like probably an hour and she's like what do you mean i'm like well i would I would use Zoom to do the video interviews, right? Just like use a Google Sheet to keep all your like LA friends who you have, who you want in the first like cohort. And then- It's an MVP prototype, just right? tested. And, and so they put, and I'm like, you could even charge for this. So, so she goes through the process with her good friend and, um, and, that, and it actually worked. So like things were, people were going on dates um, and people were like resubscribing to the next cohort. But by cohort three, my friend and her friend realized they hate working with each other. And it was like, then they split off and they saved so much time and so much money. I know. And, and so I think there's, there's an ability today to be that scrappy um, with validating ideas before you even have to even think about coding them. And even when you have to think about coding them, you can go to the no code tools to get a prototype that's like um, pretty good. You know, you've been, a, and, and, and a thank you, you've been a big supporter of roomy.ai. Oh, hell yeah. And, yeah. and for video conferencing, and uh, I know you just mentioned Zoom, but we don't do that, so. I won't, Sorry, I won't, yeah, I, won't I should have said Ruby. I won't, I, won't yeah. I won't take offense. No, yeah. we don't have APIs for that. But, um, you know, that was something that I built, kind of scratched my own itch, right? Like, I built it because I needed to use something better. 
right? And uh, would love your thoughts on what you've seen so far in terms of the platform and how it's uh, how it's evolved because you've totally. been a, a power user for a few months now. For me, the the note taking is really really helpful. Um, that's one of my favorite features uh, because I'm I'm a pretty I'm either an avid note taker in meetings or I'm pacing around just walking. Um, I take most of my meetings walking my dog. So like in that context, it's actually very, very nice. Um, and I also am quite forgetful. So that feature is really good. The, the tough part about crypto is a lot of the things that are spoken about, we don't always want writ like written down. Um, that, you know, and, and so I think uh, like the end-to-end -end encrypted, again, I'm like such a niche user that I don't think that I'm actually a good like North Star to follow in terms of what my opinions are. But um, the end-to-end -end feature of encrypting these notes would be quite helpful for me, uh, knowing that no one else is going to get this, but I can talk about certain key decisions, like how many tokens should go to this or that, or what's the algorithm, you know, things that are IP that I wouldn't want anyone else to hear. Um, having that written down for me, because the AI is really accurate, uh, is really nice. The chat feature that I talked to you about, I don't know, is that in there yet? It's going live this week. Okay, yeah. So live chat is also quite helpful, um, especially if you can intervene with the AI a little bit um, and, and like use Oh, you'll it. be able to query it. You'll be able to say, hey, what, 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 what book did Vinny recommend last month? And it'll, Oh, man, it'll, that, it'll that's out. really nice. But, but overall, the video quality is really strong. Um, I, I haven't had any audio problems. I haven't had any video issues. And um, the only reason that sometimes I think on our team we don't use it is because everything's on the fly and we talk to each other in Discord. And sometimes we'll just sit in a, in a room in Discord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, muted. Put, put, and put on the, yeah. the audience. Stuff, right. Yeah. And so the, the, even though it's very easy for me to generate a, uh, a roomy link and send it, it's one more step than it is to just hit phone on Discord and then call up. And for us... I rarely use video either. So um, I think the interface for um, like- Well, audio, just, audio still gets recorded. Totally. Which is great. No, I, I, I don't want to, this, this is not meant to be a-, a Oh, uh, we can keep, a, yeah, 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 keep going. A yeah. Rumi infomercial, but yeah. uh, you know, it's, just, it's, it's great just when founders are bouncing ideas around back and forth and learning from each other. And you know, I always love chatting to, to power users of my products. And I, when I'm a power user of someone else's product, I give feedback, so. Totally, yeah. It's very helpful. It's really strong, it's, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for being on the show, Jonathan. Um, do you have any other thoughts you want to leave your audience with? I think, you know, I think I've said my, my part pretty much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm around to keep the conversations going that if anyone's interested in talking about we'll these link things. Your, we'll link your Twitter below. Yeah, and, yeah, perfect. Uh, um, you, know, you know, and obviously glyph.io is your website. So, you know, great to have you on board. And, thank you for having uh, me. Good luck. I'm excited yeah. for the future. Thank you. Thank you. This was a pleasure.